Fat Guy 12, welcome back. How are you, Joseph? Hey, hey, Dale. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great always to be good. Back. Yeah, always good to have you. Uh, why don't we start with uh, the Fed from last week? In your view, uh, was that a pivot? Well, if you look at the markets, it seems like the markets are fairly convinced, right? I think yeah, we got right. as much as six rate cuts next week, uh, next year. So I actually think almost it feels is- like next next week we'll get all six. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe if that happens then the market will thinking start thinking we're going to get 12 so right. when i think about what happened last week i i think what happened is that so you have the fed chair who probably is one of the more hawkish members on the committee and he basically got overruled by everyone else now the way the fed works is that the fed chair obviously has the most power and he goes to great efforts to try to lobby everyone else on the committee so that they, everyone is on the same page and that there are no dissents. So, you know, you, you don't really get very much dissents in the Powell Fed. What was special, though, is that you also have this thing called the dot plot where every FOMC member is free to go and list where they think, uh, let's say, inflation, growth and the policy rate will be over the next few years. Chair Powell doesn't uh, lobby for that. He lets people do whatever they want on their SCP dot plot. And I think the big contrast is that in the SCP dot plot, everyone else, the committee as a whole, is markedly more dovish than expected, penciling in three cuts next year. Now, I don't think Powell says that, but because this is something uh, that happens in the future, uh, he doesn't have a lot of control over it. And the market looked at that and began to understand that uh, even though you have Chair Powell there, everyone else on the committee is quite dovish. And so the markets are bound with that. Now, there are a couple Why of things. Why the pushback, can, Joseth, um, in the things last couple of days? There. So uh, yeah. like you mentioned, you got uh, John Williams out on Friday. John Williams, president of the New York Fed. He's the third most important person there. He gave an eight-minute interview with CNBC trying to uh, walk back. Well, actually, if you listen to it, and I encourage you to, my sense was this guy was kind of nervous and he was doing everything he can to get the market to price in fewer cuts next year. So he wanted to tighten policy a bit because he didn't want uh, the market to price in all this. There's a prospect that all this easing could, again, reignite inflation. So he doesn't want that. But if you just listen to that, it's very obvious that this guy is just a dove. He's pretending to be a hawk for whatever reason. So I think it's not convincing in the market you know, kind of uh, kind of tighten policy a little bit. So rates went up a little bit during the interview and then that, that all faded. I, I think that's the right thing to do because uh, they've kind of gave the game away. People on the FOMC, people who are put in there, uh, a lot of them by President Biden um, are, are just dovish. That's just how they think. And so that's, that's uh, what we see in the markets. I, I think that's probably the right approach. Now, one other thing that I would note, and I know you guys have been talking about currency and so forth. Um, if you go look at what happened last week, we also got a lot of central banks speak from other central banks. Yes. Now, if you listen to Madame Lagarde from the ECB, she will very clearly tell you that we're not thinking about cutting rates. Now, all this, of course, is going to be done with the Fed in mind because the Fed <laughs> gave the game away and basically let everyone know that they're thinking about cutting. So everyone else had to react to that. So Madame Lagarde, goes on stage, says it, you know, um, I'm not thinking about cuts. We're not thinking about cuts. And I have clips on this on, on my latest YouTube video. And okay. you also have the Bank of Canada governor, Governor Macklin. He, he gave an interview as well. He's like, we're not thinking about cuts. Okay. And you also had the Bank of England give their monetary policy committee. Now, they didn't give a uh, press conference, but they did vote. And they voted to uphold to maintain rates where they currently were. But there was a, some dissents. It was a 6-3 decision. There are three people who dissented. Now, those three people, are they thinking about cuts? Is that why they dissented? Well, actually, no. They dissented because they actually wanted to hike rates. So what you're what you're seeing is a very weird situation where uh, the Fed, for, what, for whatever reason, okay, so because it's a dovish Fed, uh, is thinking about cuts and everyone else in the world is strongly pushing back against that. So... Uh, that's why you see the dollar sell off a lot. And, you know, that, that that's really surprising to me because if you look at global growth, the U.S. is doing much better than any of those other places. But uh, one of our attendees, weird... 
Uh, one of our attendees is saying uh, Goldsby's on CNBC. I saw him on the Sunday show. So he's making the rounds and trying to say, you know, uh, we're not sure. So uh, another semi pushback on what could happen. He calls it the golden path is where we have that soft landing. I believe Does he Goldsby, have credibility with you? No, no, Goldsby? no. He he's uh, he's just a political hack. He doesn't uh, matter okay. at all. So <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about Goldsby, though. So all right. Um, on Friday, he actually was on on the headline on the uh, wire saying that he'd be cutting rates in March. Okay. So Goldsby, he, he originally a professor at the University of Chicago, and then he. Uh, was an official in the Obama administration for for a while there. And when you're a part of you know, any administration, you're basically a political player. You do whatever you are told. And that's what, exactly, exactly what he did when he was at the Obama administration. Just basically a spokesperson uh, for uh, for for that part, uh, for for the political class. Now, right. he, of course, did, his good, did a good job, was a good soldier. And then he was appointed as president of the Chicago Fed. When he was appointed, he actually did not have the support of a couple Fed governors because my guess is that they understood that this guy has a history of basically being a political operative. And I think that's what he's doing right now. So he's been dovish uh, past week and probably got yelled at by Jay Powell the past weekend. So he's back uh, trying to walk back some of his comments. But the truth is anyone who follows the Fed knows that this guy doesn't vote, doesn't matter, and really no one respects him. Okay. So let's get to the dollar here, Joseph. I know uh, for the most part, since I've known you and have talked to you, you've uh, been dollar bullish. I can't, I can't do that remember. anymore, Dale. Can't do that. I, I'm surprised right. I got that call really wrong, man. I was thinking that I thought All a couple right. things. One, U.S. growth, oh, very strong. Eurozone okay. heading into recession. Canada heading into recession. Uh, the U.K. not doing that great. At the same time, all these other guys have floating rate mortgages, so their people are going to get squeezed. They're going to be under a lot of political pressure uh, to not hike too much. But at the end of the day, it's the U.S. economy that's doing quite well. Uh, that's <laughs> that's going to be cutting, uh, at least telegraphing cuts sooner than everyone else. So uh, that's a situation where I I, um, I I'm not in any dollar trades at the moment. Okay. So I that it's not clear to me what how this is going to play out. Okay, uh, you know. I, I think that's wisdom. You know, uh, let me ask you this. Earlier in your career, if you didn't know what to do with a sector or an instrument, didn't you feel more uncomfortable about that when you were younger than you do now? Uh, because when we're younger, uh, for some reason, we feel like we should know. And uh, it's okay to not know and just let the picture clear up for you. So neutral the dollar, that's a, a different position than bear, uh, than bullish or bearish a dollar. Uh, you know, I know people that are saying that this is a massive top in the dollar and that, you know, this was a pretty weak rally that we had to 104. You can see this rally here, but we're completing here. So if you don't know where it's going to go, you know what? Uh, when people ask me about currency, I'll say, I don't know. And it must be okay because Joseph <laughs> Wang doesn't know. Well, well you know, if a smart a... guy like that doesn't know, how how could, uh, you know, a guy who went to a state university understand? Well, what, do you, what are you guys thinking about the dollar? Dale, you're, you're thinking about there's a big bear market in the dollar? It, it looks like yeah. that's, that's, uh, that's what the uh, central banks are doing right now. Yeah. I and guess in that situation. That, isn't that the Ray Dalio... Now? Or, or the guy from Bridgewater, that was his uh, biggest trade, uh, being short the dollar. Now, I think we could get a bounce from lower levels, but why can't we have this from where we started here at 107.40? You could take it a lot lower. And, and wouldn't that be a way for uh, economic weakness to be kind of camouflaged and the market even do better? Um, because of a weaker dollar being more of a tailwind for the market than a strong dollar being a headwind? Yeah, a weaker dollar is positive for equity markets in the U.S. and very positive for global growth. 
So okay. globally speaking, you know, the dollar is the reserve currency. A lot of people use it, even though they don't live in the U.S. So when you have <clears throat> dollar rates and dollar currency weakening, in a sense, you're loosening you're loosening credit conditions for all these other foreign companies that have to borrow dollars or use dollars. So uh, it, it's very much growth positive globally and stock market positive. So, okay. but I, I would also just note one thing though. <clears throat> So the market is probably getting ahead of itself, pricing in all these red cuts. And you have two things that could derail this dollar bear market. Uh, one is that because rates have eased so significantly in the U.S., you actually see another wave of inflation that forces the market to also price in, again, price out these cuts. That's in pricing a higher rate trajectory. So U.S. dollar rates go back up, dollar strengthens again. So that, that's one possibility simply through inflation. Uh, the second possibility is that you have all these other countries who actually do end up in significant economic distress next year, and they end up chasing the Fed and cutting rates as well. So that, that's a couple of things to keep in mind. But again, these are just potential scenarios. Uh, what, what you're talking about, you know, you guys are, uh, the trend is your friend, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at this 10-year, and this has been a pretty good move, right, Joseph, from 5 to, you know, where we're at now, about 390. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, I just think it's uh, possible that yields just don't drop like everyone's thinking to 3 or 2.5. But maybe what you're talking about is starting to happen in the Red Sea because lower oil prices – has really been a boon for inflation coming down. And if there's a problem with the supply chain of getting tankers through the Red Sea, et cetera, they have to go around Africa that maybe oil could contribute to that. But wouldn't a weak dollar also contribute to inflation because nominally um, everything costs more because of weaker dollar? Dollar goes down 10%. Uh, metal prices could go up another 10% just based upon a falling dollar. Yeah, and you see that the past week, right? So dollar weekends, you see gold going up and you see oil going up. So these global commodities, uh, they usually trade inverse to the dollar. Now, it's not the only thing that matters, but you're, you're right. Giving a, a weaker dollar is a tailwind for commodity prices. Okay. So uh, when I look at yields, can you come up with any case that people are proved wrong, even the Fed, like in the 70s, where they thought they had victories, and then they found out they didn't, and they had to embark on a campaign again, where everyone thinks this is a high in yields forever, this 5% level, and that somewhere in here we base out, and next year we make new highs in 10-year yields. I know there are still some people looking for higher rates Oh, yeah, that, that's me, actually. That's me. <laughs> oh, OK. Is uh, that part me. of no. what you write about, like reflexivity? Uh, so listen, for me, I believe that we are in a structural bear market for 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 rates. That is to say yield trend structurally higher. And from from what I see, there's just really no way around that. That That's just my highest conviction call may not pan out tomorrow. But structurally, right. this is going to happen. I don't see any other way this could be otherwise. You can look at it in, in a couple of ways. You simply take a graph of the U.S. deficit, expanded 7% now, projected to expand without bounds going forward. You know, like anything else, rates are just supply and demand. You have a lot of treasuries being issued. If you want to look at it from a more fundamental perspective, you know, that that is inflationary. And we are going into a world where our workforce population workforce population is not growing at the same rate that it used to. Got boomers retiring. And remember, people had smaller families in the 1980s. So we're going to have upward pressure on wages uh, for the foreseeable future. We've already seen that, right? Pandemic, we have a lot of boomers retire earlier than expected and wages zoomed higher, unemployment zoomed lower. That's a structural feature of the economy simply because of demographics. So, so I think that's going to keep inflation uh, elevated as well. Now, I know there are a lot of people who think that rates only go lower, we're going into structural yeah. deflation and so forth. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who grew up in two decades of a bond bull market, and that's heavily, heavily colored how they view the world. But I believe that the future will not look like the past. And so um, 
you know, this is, uh, I think this is just a correction and uh, we're sure. going to go higher and we'll see higher highs in treasury yield, 10 year treasury yields next year. Three, uh, 360. I mean, 569, 570. Uh, for in the 10 year, I think yeah. we can, well, we'll definitely be above 5%. I, I think that, but so it's not going to be a straight line, right? I think we could touch yeah. five and a half, but um, we're going, it's just not going to go straight up. It's going to be like it is this year. Like all assets are, you go up and then you trace and then you go up again. Uh, but I think we'll end the year above 5% next year in the 10 year. So uh, what about people that are afraid that they're going to miss a rate window, uh, you know, at 5% and, they're coming into uh, the bond market. I, I've talked to someone that said that this rally in bonds is a risk-off rally. Do you agree with it or just a short well, squeeze? You, well, it could definitely be a short squeeze. I think you can, yeah. uh, to risk off, I'm not sure. It looks like equity yeah. markets are really risk on. So I it, sure it, are. that doesn't, doesn't seem to be consistent with that. Yeah. You think it has legs like a lot of people do? I mean, this was one hell of a bear market so can we get uh this bear market rally to keep going i mean even up to 120 some people are calling for it i i i don't think so i so when i look at the tenure i mean i think we could go as low as three and a half i, I okay. don't think we'll get there but i think that's that would i don't think we'll get there i think we could yeah. probably be between you know, maybe base around here, actually, maybe be yeah, base around here, 370, around this range. Okay. Um, what really surprises me is the 30 year. Um, the 30 year looks, it's at 4% now. I, I would be really surprised if it would go much lower. It really doesn't make sense for the 30 year to, to be there where it is. From my okay. perspective, on the one hand, a 30 year just doesn't have a lot of demand and we're going to have a lot of issuance in the coming issuance cycle. On the other hand, you know, there's talk about the Fed changing the inflation target i think they will and if you are someone buying 30-year bond yet you have to keep that in mind okay uh why don't we talk about your writings about crash up i didn't <laughs> delve into it but i i love the title yeah and so I, i'm assuming you're talking about equities having to crash up yeah Agreed? i'm really bullish on equities so um so i think again we always the way that we be, view the present and the future is often colored by our past. And if you are a trader like like anyone here today, you live through the COVID crash, you live through the um, 2008 financial crises. These are all crashes to the downside. So that's a work, that's how we color our perception, right? We're always worried that sometime somehow everything is going to fall apart, and you know we're going yeah. to be down, limit down seven percent or something like that. Uh, but I think. The risk right now is that we actually crash up, is that we have a rally. And maybe like David Hunter says, we go to 6,000 or something higher than we expect. Um, I think what people don't fully understand is what it means to have a deficit that is about 7% and getting larger. That's not something we have to deal with in, in our lifetime. At a, at a very high level, and I explained this in my post, deficit spending in the modern financial system is mechanically equivalent to just printing money. Um, Usually you have mechanisms that dampen on the inflationary effects of this. You have central bank, you have a bond market, but all those guys, for whatever reason, are, are not pushing back against this. And so you have the possibility of some serious upside in equities in this setup. Dovish okay. Fed, massive deficit spending, economy does does well, bond market still delusional. So I think there's there's a, I think that's part of the reason why equities continue to go higher. And I think next year will be a really good year for the S and P five hundred. Uh yeah. Uh, uh David said this is the end of a long term cycle. I don't know if it goes back to um I, I consider the beginning of this bull market, August nineteen eighty two. We were at six sixty and uh in the dow and you know that's a long term that's a 40-year bull market so you know there is an expression and you've seen it as a trader the biggest moves come at the end right well, I, I, you got blow-offs yeah yeah parabolic yeah, no. parabolic you the moment you see it going up every day being un unstable and volatile that's uh that's when you got to be careful Okay, so do you ever buy any VIX protection for your long positions? Do you ever hedge your long positions in the market? So 
I hedge. So a lot of my exposure to the upside is through call options right now. And so that's okay. kind of how I hedge because you, you know, you, you just lose the principal. I lose the, um, the, uh, premium. Uh, if you look at the volatility, it's quite low right now. So options are, yeah. are quite cheap. So that seems to be a good way to put this trade on. Yeah. That's amazing too. With this kind of move, uh, options are, the calls are cheap too. Yeah. In the S and P. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, Anything else you you want to talk about? You yeah you, you talk about um, the inventory, and uh, you also talk about there'll be regulate regulation will increase until liquidity improves. Is that the bill uh, that Jamie Dimon is so much against <laughs> that they're trying to pass, Joseph? Yeah, they're there. I, I hear they're taking off, taking on ads at uh, football shows too, just to uh, just to get just to get that message across. It's really a full court press in the banking sector to stop these new regulations. So there's these new set of regulations called the Basel III Endgame that that that's basically going to make it uh, make life harder for banks. It's going to increase their costs, their regulatory costs. And that has impacts on markets as well. So when you buy and sell, uh, let's say a security, you buy, it's usually you're facing a dealer and a dealer has to, all these regulatory costs. The higher the regulatory costs they have, the less likely they're going to make markets. And that's why sometimes when you have these extreme events like COVID, uh, you can have markets where even the treasury market freezes because everyone goes to sell their treasuries but the dealers, because of the regulatory costs, get maxed out and aren't able to take the other side. So you could have more volatility in markets if this actually passes because there's going to be less liquidity. Um, I, I don't know how this will pan out. It really does seem like a very strong marketing in, uh, marketing movement to try to get this uh, Basel III endgame scuttled. But so but that's just something to think about. Just structurally, again, everyone knows this there's less liquidity today than there was before the financial crisis in 2008. Yeah. And that's largely due to regulation. And the trend is that this will get worse. Um, right. I've heard people complaining about liquidity in the bond market, which uh, used to be the deepest and supposedly still is that uh, we already have that going on structurally in the bond market. Where, yeah. You know, the you used to be able to get off a uh, trade for the spreads were tighter on buys and sells on mar market orders. Now there, you know, th there's, uh, you know, maybe a two point spread used to be a decimal point. Yeah, though, no, that's going to continue. It's going to continue. It's just, well, you can think about it this way, right? So um, you have a stadium and you have so many exits. Now the stadium, let's say that that's the treasury market. It gets larger and larger and larger every year because of all the deficit spending, but the exits, that's the dealer, capacity to, to make markets that doesn't actually really change so yeah. uh, just as a one, for you. Door. one yeah, door just a, like a sad for you so um in early 2000s the treasury market the size was about seven trillion dollars and the daily cash volumes in the treasury market were about 400 billion a day on average uh, today the cash market treasury is almost four times as large so it's it's like 25 trillion dollars but the daily average volumes in the cash market, it's about 600 billion. So the cash market, 50% larger on the daily basis, but the overall outstanding treasuries is almost four times as much. So it's that classic mismatch, stadium gets larger, exits don't get larger. And so liquidity mechanically has to get worse and that's going to continue. Okay, I know that you keep a, not one eye on geo events, you and I have talked about Ukraine uh, quite a bit. And, you know, since we've last talked, uh, we have a new theater of war in the Middle East that may or may not escalate. Um, and recently, um, we're not able to get funding together for the Ukrainians. Now, uh, where do you think that's going here, Joseph, with an election year coming and uh, is it the best thing that we uh, let that go and let Ukraine fend for itself? Or should, uh, you know, the U.S. still support them? So what I see happening politically is that um, everyone believes that if the other person wins, it's going to be an existential crisis for the republic. 
And you right. see this again in think pieces by by mainstream media, right? Oh my God, if Trump wins, it's going to be the end of democracy. It's going to be fascism and so forth. Anyway, there's a lot of messaging going on that raises the stakes for this election. Now, if you are someone who perceives this to be uh, an existential crisis, then you're going to do whatever it takes to win. And whatever it takes could be just going off, uh, being a, you know, being a Fed official and signaling big dovish things, or it could be to escalate geopolitics to try to get people's mind off of other things uh, or something like that. So I, I think there could be a lot of crazy things happening next year, simply because a lot of people perceive this to be such an existential event. Okay. Um, I think that um, traditionally speaking, if you have a war, it's positive for the incumbent. So right. uh, the Biden administration always liked wars, you know, we're starting wars everywhere. Uh, you know, may maybe that continues to escalate. I, I think that's part of the reason why President Biden is so desperate to get more funding for Ukraine, because he, he just wants the war to continue. Um, the What I read is that here they're willing, right, right now, they're willing to make a deal with the Republicans where Republicans get funding for their border stuff and uh, Ukraine continues to get money for, for their war. So I think they're going to want to continue this war uh, throughout next year. Uh, okay. They, uh, that, right. that seems to be always what they liked. And and do you think that uh, now with uh, the I don't know in currencies that if you could find a spot tactically, you should own some gold in this environment and silver? Yeah, I own some gold. Uh, silver, I, I don't know as much. You know, silver has been doing well, you know, but, you know, it's part precious metal, part industrial metal and, and all that. Yeah. So gold seems to be have been holding up pretty well we we hear that there's more central bank buying but again if you're heading into a world where the dollar is weakening then um then gold is going to perform well i think the broader picture though is that inflation really has come down so we are moving into a globally uh global cycle where central banks will gradually be cutting rates probably not as much as priced into the markets but we are moving away from a globally synchronated rate hike cycle to a globally synchronated rate cut cycle and gold uh, i think usually does well does well yeah. in those scenarios as does okay so uh, part of this e uh, easing could any of it be um maybe a growth scare as part of uh the rates coming down for a bit longer is it possible i, I think it that... depends on the country i think a lot of the other central banks are looking for growth to slow hoping for it to slow uh, because they want inflation to come down so if growth slows, I think that will make them happy, and I don't think they will cut rates to to uh, to stimulate their economy. I think it's mostly focused on inflation right now. So, uh, okay. it's in, if well, inflation comes down, I don't think uh, China has inflation problems, do they? No, no, they're you're right. They're the they're the one country in the world, one of the few countries in the world that have are having economic troubles. Right, we've all read about. Yeah. Uh, their property bust and so forth. I wouldn't worry about them though. They their government has a lot of tools that Western governments don't. Right, like uh, <laughs> if any company is about to go bust, the government, which basically owns all the banks, can just order them to, to continue to lend and keep the game going. So uh, it's okay. very much up to their up to what their political class decides to do. Okay, so you don't think problems in China would uh, bleed over to the uh, you know to cause global slowing. No, it, it is handle. so. So China is a big exporter, right? So yeah. they they they're not a source of demand; they're a source of supply. So uh, when the U.S. economy picks up, then there's more activity in China because the Chinese sell more stuff to to everyone else. So I, I you know, I, I don't think of their activity as a driver of global growth so much as that everyone else's activity drives Chinese growth. Remember, China sells to people; they're the workshop of the world. Uh, they are not a source of global demand. Okay, Joseph. Well, I, I just want people to know where they they need to go to hear your read your stuff, and you do a, a couple of course markets one hundred and one. Uh, so you have a new course. Uh, what's in this new course, buddy? Oh yeah, so I have this uh, set of courses. It's uh, basically I touch teach about the different asset classes in the financial markets, how to look at them uh, from you know from equities, uh, central rate policy, rates, and, and things like that. It's, uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, the first course is free, actually. It's basically, um, when we when I was at the Fed, everyone who was uh, 
new person to the Fed goes through a training program as to how to look at markets. And I take that and I recreate it and share it with the broader public. Okay. Well, um, much to offer, a lot of knowledge to share. Yeah. Joseph. Also, just one thing I would plug. Uh, so I have a YouTube channel where every week I talk about, um, I review what happened in markets. Uh, it's called Markets Weekly and my channel is called Joseph Wayne. So, so check it out if you're interested in just... Um, weekly mar macro recaps of what happened in markets. Okay. So uh, YouTube in it. And yep. jo Joseph, uh, you know, happy holidays to you. And I hope 2024 is a, a great year for you and your friends and family and people that you teach and all your clients that it's a banner year for you. Thanks so much, guys. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk afterwards next year. All right. Best Fed luck, guy, everyone. Happy trading. Fed guy twelve. Follow Joseph. Learn what he learned at the Fed. He's sharing it. Take care. Bye, Adios, guys. Joseph. So that's a wrap, everyone. You could join the team in thirteen minutes on the Morning Edge. Remember, don't just count your pips; count your blessings. And we'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Adios. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.